Whether or not you agree with the points made in this video, try not to take the conclusions personally. If you happen to like this pairing, fine. No big deal. Jug loves Perry and I don't hate him that much for it. We're cool, so don't sweat it. And for the record, I'm partial to Wrath myself. I enjoy the potential he has as a character. His two other supports are enjoyable reads and help to flesh Wrath out as more than just a silent, brooding character, which is what I believe Wrath supports should be about. There are nice moments found sprinkled in these supports, and I suggest you read all three of them before you watch this video for the full context. Obviously, Lin and Wrath have me feeling some kind of way, but that doesn't invalidate Wrath's entire character. Lin doesn't need any introduction, so let's shift our focus and give a brief overview of Wrath. Wrath is the son of Dayan, a chieftain of the Katola tribe. Because of a prophecy that foretold Wrath saving the world from a calamity one day, he was forced to live on his own for almost his entire life. First seen working under Marcus Arifin, who is about as nice to Sakaeans as newspapers are to spiders, he meets Lin during her visit to Arifin in hopes of securing some aid against her uncle, the acting Marcus of Kaelin, Lundgren. After Wrath sees the Marcus's bigotry towards his people firsthand, he leaves his employ and instead joins Lin's cause. Support conversations in Fire Emblem 7 start after Lin mode is complete, so we don't actually get to see what Wrath has to offer character-wise until he joins back with the team. And it's not until Chapter 22 in Eliwood mode, or Chapter 23 in Hector mode, where Wrath makes his return. Because Wrath has a scant three supports, he's really depending on these conversations to develop his character. And admittedly, this support isn't completely without merit to his characterization. He goes from this taciturn, stoic Sakaian who refuses to show any vulnerability into a man who trusts Lin enough to reveal his tragic past. One of the issues with the support, however, as I will argue, doesn't consider the character that is on the receiving end of the support, Lin herself. This support might be quote unquote Wrath centric. However, that doesn't mean we can just brush aside Lin's out-of-character behavior and lack of sizable input to merely focus on one end of this chain. You could say the support is somewhat about Lin, due to her actively trying to find solidarity in their shared heritage. But Wrath has the lion's share of the focus here, as he's the man whose past and deeper characterization is what the support is goading you to learn. Despite this, this Wrath-focused support is lacking in meaningful content as it mostly boils down a loose relation of facts about his backstory with no emotional takeaway. Wrath and Lin lack chemistry, both romantic and platonic. The revelation had between the two in the A support has no real weight to it beyond Lin and Wrath both being forcibly separated from their people in some way. Their romantic ending, I feel, is couched solely on the coincidence that both characters are plainspeople of Sakae, but shared heritage alone, I argue, is not enough to justify the conclusion that these two characters work well together. At the same time, a shared sense of loneliness is not in of itself strong enough to justify Lin and Wrath functioning well romantically. Finally, this chain ends up compromising Lin's characterization by making her act more dependent than she ought to be. And on Wrath's side, the big reveal of his years of loneliness is propped up and driven by, and I need you not to freak out here, a silly backstory, which to me, contributes to stifling the emotional hook the support tries to have. The C support begins with Wrath saving Lin from something, probably another narratively convenient brigand. After thanking him for his help, she asks him if all Katola men are as quiet as him, saying that the men of her tribe are all gossiping magpies in comparison. Wrath doesn't respond and Lin begins to worry that he's angry over having being dragged into another conflict. He tells her that that's not the reason why he's quiet, he just doesn't see a need to be talkative. On Wrath's side, we learn, well, that he's considerably more stoic and quiet than most Sakaean men. This does pay off a little bit in the A support, but on its own, it's not that much of a shocker. Lin, by comparison, is far more vocal with her emotions, wondering aloud if Wrath's seemingly cold shoulder is due to something she had done. Lin expresses her insecurity over being a woman her comrades will be willing to follow, which resonates with the rest of her character arc, but all Wrath really contributes to the support is to reaffirm that, yes, he is the strong and silent type. It doesn't do much for his development, nor does he engage Lin with hers. Lin, at the beginning of the B support, is actually pretty good. Lin is caught zoning out on the battlefield and Wrath asks her what's wrong. She tries to brush aside the question, but ends up opening up and spilling her fears and anxieties over potentially losing the last of her family. In response, Wrath just says nothing. Literally, all he does is just dot 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 throughout the entire conversation. After being stonewalled by Wrath, Lin bottles her anxieties back up and quickly tries to switch topics. 
Lin asks Wrath about the Katola tribe and about its leader, Dayan, but he can't really tell her anything, because he had left the tribe 15 years ago and wandered alone ever since. My major criticism with the C and B is that barely anything significant happens in them. The most we can say is that Lin opens up about her fears, her grandfather's health, and being left alone again, which is a good furthering of her character. Wrath, however, for two entire conversations has been a po-faced statue that hasn't even once tried to empathize with Lin. Even worse, Wrath, when Lin opens up to him, responds with nothing. Legitimately, two sets of ellipses. Lin has to just shelve her fears and try to change the subject. Wrath neither tries to sympathize with her, nor even just serves as a decent sounding board. Even though it's allegedly a conversation between two people, the first two supports are Lin essentially talking to herself. Granted, Wrath actually does answer her question, and that may seem like meaningful progress is being made, but I wouldn't say that this shows Wrath opening up to Lin just yet. Wrath says nothing unless asked a direct question, and even when he does say something, his answers are terse and uninformative. Lin is quite expressive and tends to wear her emotions on her sleeves. In her supports with Kent, Florina, Elliewood, Wallace, and Hector, she's very upfront about how she feels. A defense I often hear about Wrath in this support is that Wrath is a listener, not a talker. So then, while I can complain all I want that Wrath's silence doesn't contribute to anything for Lin's growth, or Lin and Wrath's friendship, it's intentional and consistent with his character. But frankly, I find this to be a bad defense. Being a silent, emotionally narrow character is already an uphill battle, but when you basically only have three conversations to show some depth, that silence becomes even more detrimental. There are ways to show that you're a good listener other than constant ellipses. And to be honest, it's kind of insulting to Lin that after she opened up her fears about being alone again should her father die, Wrath doesn't reply. While this could work if Lin responded negatively, or even at all to his silence, Lin just brushes off her worries being completely ignored. But the support is content ending it here, asking us to accept this flat, stacking conclusion as characterization for Wrath. Sure, if you want Wrath to act the exact same for two conversations, be my guest, but I can't agree that this characterizes Wrath positively, if it even characterizes him at all. When I said in my Lin support science that Wrath and Lin didn't have good chemistry, this is what I meant. Can you really argue that Lin and Wrath's friendship is really developing after these two conversations? Lin knows almost nothing about Wrath, and Wrath may know something about Lin, but does nothing with it. And at the risk of coming off like I'm missing the point, or that I don't get it, I just want to stop there and say, actually, I do. It's obvious that Wrath's upbringing has made him much quieter than the normal Sakaean man to the point where he is more comfortable saying nothing rather than something. However, just because a character is written to be quiet or even socially awkward and their interactions with another character are intentionally written to show this, that doesn't mean it automatically makes whatever they do, or don't do, exempt from criticism. Like I said, there are ways to pull off Wrath's stoicism and antisocial behavior, but I would argue that this portrayal does a disservice to his characterization and to their chemistry. Consider this. Jafar is a similarly quiet and antisocial character, who also suffered from severe isolation as a child. He was found by Nurgle on a pile of corpses and was groomed to be a silent killing machine, and like Wrath, opts to not talk most of the time. Yet his romance with Nino is much better handled than with Wrath and Lin. Why? Well, here's the thing. It took Jafar an entire subplot, including Ursula, Zephiel, Sonya, Lin, Hector, Elliewood, and Nino, plus his support chain with Nino, for us to take this former killing machine into someone who Nino could believably have feelings for. To ask Wrath to pull something similar with so much less to work with is a huge ask, and starting their romance basically at the A support is not how you do it. The A support begins where the B left off, with Lin asking Wrath to continue his tale and to explain why he left his tribe. He explains that the tribe Diviner saw a bad omen in the stars, and as just a three-year-old child, Wrath had to set out on a journey to prevent disaster. The Diviner said that Wrath was born to save the world from a catastrophe. He begins by recounting the hardships that he faced and the ridicule he endured from his fellow plains people. He finishes his story by telling her that he does not feel the same loneliness anymore, but sometimes he remembers how painfully isolated he felt. Wrath's backstory ends here and the support shifts to Lin finding common ground in their experiences and feelings of loneliness. My first problem with the A support lies in Wrath's backstory and how silly it is. 
First of all, I find it funny that he clearly remembers verbatim what someone told him when he was three years old. That is impressive. He was kicked out of his clan at three, without the means to survive, but for some reason he survived, anyway. How? Don't know, we are just left to assume that he willed himself to survive? Was it luck? Wrath, by his own admission, had no means to survive, but somehow this three-year-old infant did just that without any real support. Is the prophecy so powerful that it consistently led him in the right direction until he could hold his own? I also think this calls into question how united Sakaeans really are. He was a lost infant wandering around Sakae and other tribes. Instead of taking him in, they laughed and ridiculed him. When Uhai takes Lin hostage on the Dread Isle, he ends up releasing her, as it would be dishonorable to kill a fellow plainsperson while they were unarmed. When the Lorca were decimated, its remnants were taken in by other tribes. Wrath mentions in his seat support that he doesn't need thanks from Lin because she's a fellow Sakaean, which also demonstrates their selflessness towards their own people. Does this hospitality only apply to women and other plains people, and not helpless infant boys? I also have issues with Wrath being fated to save the world from disaster. Quote unquote prophecy is already a played out concept in storytelling. As a child, the only way to explain away his survival is that fate willed him to survive. It's a lazy hand wave, but whatever. But even as an adult, where we see Wrath clearly holding his own and probably not depending on fate to keep himself alive, Wrath is just a mercenary biding his time. This fate feels more like coincidental meetups with Lin that will eventually see him fight dragons, rather than a more dedicated effort on him to train to become this prophesized warrior. For as life-altering and world-changing his prophecy implies, he ends up doing Jack because he's just some guy in the story. We should be more involved in Wrath's life if we were to care, but this is literally the only time we're told anything about it. It's a missed opportunity. For Wrath's backstory to rest entirely on a prophecy that we never see get played out for ourselves is disappointing. Wrath's entire childhood was ruined by this. He isn't even familiar with his own clan because he was so young when he was sent away. Does he harbor anger or resentment towards them or the prophecy? Is he angry at Dayan? He eventually returns to the Katola, but were there moments in this journey where he swore never to return? These very possible feelings aren't addressed, and the most we learn is that there were moments where the loneliness really got to him. The prophecy trope wouldn't be as bad here if this support used it as an opportunity to expand on Wrath's personality, rather than just further cementing that he's a brooding, silent guy. Wrath's backstory is hampered by the over-the-top nature of his childhood, and his characterization suffers because the writing doesn't attempt to flesh Wrath out any further than what we can already infer. Lin's reaction doesn't really do much to help this revelation land any weightier. Instead of wanting to be with Wrath because she can empathize with his loneliness and give him the human interaction that had escaped him for years, she admires Wrath because he handles being alone better than she does. You sure it's alright for you to be here? The battle's not over. You're right, but I don't feel I can leave you. When I'm with you, I feel safe. I can sense your strength. Please, Wrath, let me stay here, just for a while. I truly don't believe this is in character for Lin. Yes, Lin desires companionship and for people to understand her, but when this occurs, Lin still retains her independence. For Lin, a fierce warrior and noblewoman, who is quick to prove wrong those who dismiss her for being a woman, to suddenly become submissive and reliant on someone she shares almost nothing in common with does not add up. This is a far-fetched leap to a romantic conclusion, foregoing chemistry or reasonable relationship building in order to give Sue a potential mom. Consider some of her other endings and how she gets there. She finds comfort with Hector because he understands her feelings of loss, and the two end up sharing mutual respect, yet she never tells Hector that she needs him to feel safe. In fact, she wants to be the one who makes him feel safe, to give him a person to talk to about his feelings about losing his parents and eventually brother. Elliewood encourages Lynn to stay true to herself in the face of an aristocracy that doesn't accept her. But Lynn doesn't suddenly begin relying on Elliewood as a familiar crutch for this world of nobility in the A support. She takes his encouragement in stride, and together they hope to face a society that might not be so quick to accept her. The subsequent conclusion is built up through the genuine admiration he pays Lin throughout the B support. And if you want an example of Lin relying on someone done right, her support with Florina does the job exceptionally well. 
Despite the support beginning with Lynn acting as Florina's protector, Florina remarks that she wants to become someone who can protect her, someone she can rely on. And through the next two conversations, she does just that, not sharpening her skills in combat to become more physically reliable, but rather by actively engaging Lin about her insecurities with living as a noblewoman of Sakai and ultimately helping Lin stay true to what she desires. Lin's consistently characterized as someone who's riddled with insecurities and anxieties about her self-worth and how she should live her life. Someone who can effectively help her through her fears and doubts would be someone she would reasonably find comfort and safety in. These three relationships she has sees Lynn feel more at ease with herself than before while still building upon that enthusiastic go-getter attitude that she's famous for. Wrath doesn't facilitate any sort of emotional catharsis, but this chain concludes as though he does. He displays no rapport with her that would even imply a friendly partnership, let alone a budding romance. When I'm with you, I feel safe is a line thrown in by the writers because without it, the player would have no reason to assume that Lin feels anything for Wrath. There is no textual support for it, so the writers have no choice but to tell, not show, in order to reach their quota of apparent ending for Wrath. And if, like me, you aren't sold on the two working on a personal level, then the only thing that's really left pairing them together is because they're both Sakaian. To justify a romantic pairing based solely on the shared racial heritage is, in my opinion, a lazy and cliche way to ship two people together. It's the token minority couple trope played straight. If we want to be engaged in this romance, we need to see the two engaging each other's experiences and feelings, filling out what the other person lacks. To wrap this up, Wrath's backstory is ridiculous, and the relationship with Lin is just her projecting things onto him. Oh, you're lonely like me, man, you're strong, probably. It's really the odd support out for Lin. Lin has some serious insecurities and hangups, but her wrath support has her uncharacteristically vulnerable to someone who shows no interest in her feelings. At the end of the day, this support sucks because their friendship barely improves over the course of the support. Wrath's defining moment ends up being compromised by an overused narrative device that does not actually improve his characterization in any meaningful way. And lastly, the support weakly attempts to justify Lin's romantic feelings for Wrath by literally writing it in, because there is hardly any chemistry between them to begin with. To end on a positive note, let me just say this. This is a third of Wrath's support pool. Even though his supports with Guy and Will are lesser known, those do more for Wrath's characterization than his one with Lin. I think it's important to recognize the potential that Wrath has. Blazing Sword is legit not doing him any favors by restricting him to a measly three supports. If we had a couple more supports, and more opportunities to explore how living under this prophecy truly affects Wrath outside of what we come to expect that isn't just headcanon, Wrath's unique place in the story can be more realized.